Hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talks. This is a series of how-to videos where we cover uh, everything from the codes and standards that apply to our work out in the field, to individual pieces of equipment, to installation techniques, to uh, maintenance techniques and so forth. All that apply to our work out in the electrical field. Anyway, I'm Randy Barnett. I'll be your facilitator uh, for this presentation. And this is brought to you by ECM Magazine. That's from ecmweb.com is where you need to go. So go to ecmweb.com and in the upper left hand corner there's a drop down menu. Go ahead and click on that and the very first item is premium content. You want to go ahead and sign up for premium content if you haven't already. Uh, it's free and you'll get tons of free information, especially related to the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is uh, insulation resistance testing. So we're going to talk about insulation resistance testing. Insulation resistance testing applies to anywhere we have wires, conductors with insulation on them, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's a residential application or three-phase motor or commercial application or rooftop unit, a uh, 500 horsepower motor out in an industrial application. Insulation breaks down and we need to see the condition of our equipment to make sure that one, it's safe to continue to operate and two, we want to reduce downtime as well, don't we? So let's take, uh, for example, let's say that, now I'm not, right? But let's say that I were a uh, the world's greatest hydraulic engineer, okay? And um, so here I am, a, I'm a hydraulic engineer and you've come to me and asked me to design a system for you that's going to operate at 1500 psi 1500 pounds pressure so i say sure i can do that for you so i go ahead and i design the system and build it and probably one thing i ought to do is i ought to test it right make sure there are no leaks on it so what i'm going to do is uh, uh i'll cap off everything what you know whatever i need to do and then i'll go ahead and I'll apply some pressure to that system. Maybe I'll apply, uh, I don't know, 25 or 50 or 100 PSI. So let's go ahead and charge that 1500 pound system up to 100 PSI and see if we get any leaks or not, huh? Oh, no leaks at 100 pounds pressure. Here you go, here's your new hydraulic system. That'd be crazy, I don't think you'd hire me again, huh? You see, it'd be kind of ridiculous if we didn't check it at what, maybe, I don't know, 1500 or 2,000 PSI. The same is true when it comes to our electrical insulation on these wires. Whether it's, uh, you know, the THHN insulation like we have in this panel board, or we have specially varnished insulation we find on motors, things like that. And so we need to uh, test that insulation at least what it's rated for. So probably, well, the THHN is rated for 600 volts. The motor is rated for 480 volts. Certainly we ought to be checking it at least at those voltage levels, maybe even a little bit higher. Because after all, voltage is the pressure that's going to cause current to flow. And we want to make sure the current stays on the copper and doesn't leak out the insulation into the metal components of our system. We call that a ground fault, don't we? Anytime current flows into the normal non-current carrying parts of our system, uh, non-current carrying metal parts of our system, we call that a ground fault. We don't want ground faults. Okay? Real world, we have some ground faults out there. We live with them, uh, but we want to keep them to a minimum. I'm going to give you some numbers as we go along. So let's take, uh, for an example, let's say you get a service call at a residential application uh, home, and the breaker keeps tripping. You know, imagine that, right? And so they call you up, hey, the breaker keeps tripping. We can't keep it reset. Well, something's wrong. Stop resetting it and trying to close it again. We need to go out and maybe do an insulation resistance test. We'll do some initial checks and, and uh, visual checks and so forth, see what we can find going on. But we think, you know, maybe I've got a ground fault somewhere in the system, a short circuit to ground, and it keeps tripping the breaker. So, a couple of key things. I want to disconnect what I'm reading from the rest of the system. In other words, in this case, I've gone ahead and I've pulled the ungrounded conductor away from the uh, 15 amp breaker. So I've disconnected those two because I'm going to read anything what's downstream, whatever it is. And so maybe I need to go down and unplug things downstream or whatever in order to isolate where my problem is. So that's just part of that systematic troubleshooting I have to do along the way. Another thing 
And probably the number one rule is always, 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 always we want to turn the power off, don't we, before we do any type of insulation resistance test. Our insulation resistance tester puts out a DC voltage. We can select, depending on the type tester it is, maybe 50, 250, 500 volts DC, 1,000 volts DC, whatever it is. And so we don't want to take and put a DC battery, right, onto a live energized circuit. So we always make sure that our circuit is de-energized before we do any insulation resistance test. Now another trick to watch is uh, make sure you don't apply <clears throat> this DC test voltage to any electronics. So if you're going to troubleshoot something like you suspect maybe a bad fan motor in an HVAC system or something, make sure you disconnect that fan so that you're not getting any voltage applied to that printed circuit board inside of that unit or whatever. Right? So make sure you de-energize the equipment, make sure you don't apply to any electronics, and then disconnect your equipment to isolate it so that you know what you're doing your insulation resistance test on. So, let's get going and we'll do a little insulation resistance test. Now, I said I don't want to uh, check my 600 volt insulation at, say, you know, something significantly less than 600 volts. It may be fine at 600 volts. For instance, uh, I could go ahead and let's check this motor and I turn my multimeter. I'm just going to use my multimeter short out my leads and make sure I get zero ohms and I'm going to take and put one test lead on the frame of the motor, a good ground connection and I'll put the other test lead on the winding and I read OL open circuit on my meter which means I have an infinite amount of resistance that's terrific huh that's great but how much voltage did this multimeter put out I don't know let's check it and see I'll take I'm still set on resistance on this meter and I've got another multimeter I'll set it up to read volts DC volts and I'll just go ahead and plug the test leads in to my other meter negative in the common positive in the plus and uh, oh, let me change the range and uh, I'm getting right at right at 2 volts about 1.9 something volts okay well, wait a minute then in other words this meter, this digital multimeter, is putting out somewhere around 2 volts to check a 600 volt circuit. That doesn't make much sense, does it? So that's why it doesn't do me much good, really, to use a digital multimeter. If I do use a digital multimeter to, to check a circuit and I get a really low resistance reading, I've probably got problems and I definitely need to get my insulation resistance tester out. So let's take a look at the uh, insulation resistance tester. And so we've got different scales on this one. This one also works as a multimeter. Many different manufacturers, varieties out there and so forth. So let's go ahead and I'll uh, do a little test. So let's say we get a call from the homeowner and the breaker keeps tripping. We suspect that maybe we've got some insulation nicked off of a wire, maybe the motor's failed somewhere, whatever it is, we want to make sure we've got good insulation resistance to operate this equipment. So I'll go ahead and I'll take one test lead, and of course I've verified everything, de-energized, no power coming into this anyway, and uh, I'll put one test lead on ground, and then I'll put the other test lead on the conductor. So now, yep, got it on the copper conductor. Now I'll go ahead and I'll select whatever voltage I want to on my uh, insulation resistance tester. And if you think about it, that's THH insulation. It's rated for 600 volts. It's only going to have 120 volts phase to ground, ungrounded conductor to ground applied to it right now. So I think I'll go ahead and maybe I'll select, uh, oh, I don't know. I have different ranges. I could select 500 volts. So let's go ahead and see what it does at 500 volts. Now I go ahead and I push the test push button and see what I read. And I read 550 mega ohms. 550 million ohms. 550 million ohms, huh? That's a lot of resistance. 
Now the minimum value I should be looking for anytime I do an insulation resistance test, five mega ohms, I would say minimum. Some standards you might see refer to uh, two and a half mega ohms and, and uh, then adding to that based on the voltage level of the insulation. But I'd say my experience is if I see less than five mega ohms of resistance when I'm running an insulation resistance test, I'm probably looking at a piece of equipment that's real close to failure, if not already failed. Now, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and check the uh, windings. We already did an insulation resistance test. Uh, um, or excuse me, yeah, we did, well, we did a check with the digital multimeter, okay, where we set it up to read resistance, and we tried to read from phase to ground. Now, before I take these leads off and move them over to the motor and do a test, I've got to be thinking, just now, when I applied that 500 volts to this circuit, depending on how long that circuit is, those electrons went up into the insulation and they charged up inside of that or charged up that insulation. So I've got a static charge built up in those uh, uh, conductors that I just tested. Now, almost I would say probably all of our modern test sets that we find, uh, once we stop the test, it'll go ahead and bleed the voltage back to zero. But I can go ahead and use my multimeter and do that test as well. Simple uh, residential panel as opposed to maybe that 500 horsepower motor out in the field with a lot of windings and I could have a lot of charge built up at maybe a thousand volts or so inside of those windings. So before I put my hands on there and start going back to work on that wire and connecting circuits, whatever I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and verify it de-energized. So I want to take my meter and make sure that it first works on voltage. I have a proving unit over here on the wall. And I can go ahead, when I plug into this proving unit, it'll put out 240 volts DC or AC, and I've selected the DC position. When I push in, the little green light comes on in the proving unit. That indicates that it's putting out voltage, and sure enough, on my meter I'm reading 239.4 volts. So I know that my meter works on voltage. Now, if I were going to check this, and I really thought there was a possibility I might get a shock, which there is, I'm going to wear my rubber gloves because I'm going to be very close. Now, uh, in this case, it could be charged up to 500 volts. Now, it's probably died off to zero. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. But I'd go ahead and test it, especially, like I say, on a larger piece of equipment or longer conductor runs, you will build up voltage inside of those conductors. I do my standard test inside and out on my glove, don't I? I check for any signs of physical cracking, uh, ozone checking, I pull apart on the fingers, I go through my glove, I clean it if necessary, and as I say, inside and out. So I turn it inside out. And then put it on the opposite hand, check the inside of it. No dirt, no oil, no contamination, no grease, it's not dirty. I don't see any physical damage. So, so far it seems good to go. Another thing I need to check is the test state on these gloves. I make sure they've been tested within the last six months. I've got the proper size and voltage rating on my gloves. Leather protector as well. Make sure there's no physical damage to it. It'll get a little bit dirty as I use it, of course, but no physical damage, no ripped seams. I don't feel anything on the inside of the glove. And it's the proper uh, glove protector size for the appropriately sized glove. Now, I would go ahead and put on my rubber gloves then, having checked them both. And now I could take my meter, set it up once again for our DC volt. We just check to make sure the meter works properly. If there's any doubt in my mind, I'll come back over here, check it again. 240, I come over here, I put one test lead on ground, I put the other test lead on the conductor, and I read 0, 0.0 volts. Huh? So it's de-energized. Okay? I have one last step, and that's to come back and make sure my meter still works properly on voltage. Now I've done that live dead live test, it would be safe to go ahead and take off my gloves and go to work on this equipment. Let's talk about how we're going to test this motor and a couple of uh, uh, important tests that we can do when it comes to a motor. So to test my motor, I'll go ahead and take my test leads, and I'll put one test lead on ground, exposed metal frame of the motor. And I'll take the other test lead, and I'll put it on 
one of the phase conductors. I'll choose phase A first. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to set up my tester to read, uh, do, my, do my insulation test. And so I'll select a voltage. That's a 480 volt, one quarter horsepower motor. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and select it uh, um, to read 1,000 volts. Okay? So I'm going to test it at 1,000 volts and see how it does. So I'll select 1,000 volts over here in my range. And now I'm all set up, and I can go ahead and push my test button, and we'll see what reading I get. And I get 2.2 giga ohms, not even mega ohms, giga ohms, 2.2 giga ohms. That's great. That's terrific. That's way above that 5 mega ohms I'm looking for. Let's say, though, in reality, I get a reading maybe, I don't know, 250 mega ohms. And... Uh, a oh, couple months, I come back, part of my routine maintenance, and I check that motor again, and I get uh, 200 mega ohms. My next test date, I get 180 mega ohms, and then 120. And it's, it's consistently going down over time. I suspect I've got something wrong with that insulation, but of course, I'm not sure what. So there are two more tests that I can run. I can go ahead and run this test for 10 minutes. And I can take a reading at one minute and then take another reading at 10 minutes. And I divide the one minute reading into the 10 minute reading. And that gives me what's called the polarization index. And that ratio should be at least two. If it's not at least two, I've probably got a motor that's about ready to fail, if not already. Another reading that I can do is I can go ahead and push my button in and take a reading at 30 seconds and take another reading at one minute. And then what I'll do is I'll divide the 30 second reading into that 60 second reading. And that gives me something called the, the dielectric absorption ratio, the DAR. It should be at least 1.25. If not, once again, I've got a problem. Now what's nice if I do a DAR or PI polarization index test, I've learned something about the quality of my insulation. If I don't meet those ratio values, it probably means I've got some type of impurities or contamination on the insulation. Water, dust, dirt, oh, maybe oil leaking out of that bearing, huh? leaking from the grease in that bearing and tracking back into the, into the uh, windings of the motor and so on. So anyway, I can fix that problem. So I can do the spot reading test, which is a one minute test. When I come up to do my initial test on my motor or on my conductor inside the panel board. I should take a reading after I energize the conductors for one minute. That's called a spot reading test. That gives time enough for my dielectric absorption and capacitance effects and all of this uh, to take effect. And then I finally get the leakage current reading after one minute. And I use that for a standard. Another thing I probably should do too is I should look in the manufacturer's instructions and find a table that's going to tell me how to correct that uh, re resistance of that copper based on the temperature. Because you see, as the temperature of the copper changes, so will the resistance reading on the copper. So I should always use one standard temperature for adjusting my temperature readings and resistance readings. So consult the manufacturer's instructions. They usually have those in the charts. So what's nice is if I don't meet the requirements on the DAR or the PI, I can clean those windings, you see. The spot reading test told me I had, whether or not I had a problem, but I don't know what it is. But if I take the DAR or the PI, I find out my windings are contaminated, I can clean that. I can disassemble a motor and clean it. I can dry out a motor, and I can get the spot reading in those other uh, DAR and PI uh, index values up to where I need them then. So anyway, that's insulation resistance testing, you know, once again in a nutshell in our Tech Talk videos. I want to mention uh, two other things to you. One is not insulation resistance testing, but it's this device. This is a digital low resistance ohm meter. It reads out in millions of an ohm or micro ohms. And where I'm going to use this is to check the resistance across a set of contacts when they go closed. That'd be a common application. And then we didn't talk at all at uh, checking insulation quality above 1,000 volts. That's going to take some special equipment to test that. We call that a high pot. 
and there are different methods of high pot testing and different types of testers out there. So that would be another topic for us. Anyway, I think that's probably all the time we got today on our uh, Tech Talk video. And so remember, this is brought to you by ECM Magazine, uh, ecmweb.com. They're part of the Endeavor portfolio of business publications. Bottom line is you go out of here, make sure you do your installation resistance testing, but make sure you follow those safety rules as well when you do it. Keep yourself safe, and we'll see you at the next Tech Talk.